Howdy doody everyone, and welcome back to my journey across the United States. Today, we're visiting North Dakota, the Rough Rider State, fresh off the heels of my worst video ever on internet mysteries. Regardless, you'll notice I've decided to upgrade this series a bit. This video should be longer than the usual length, and I think I'm going to stick with this longer video format because it seems to do a little bit better here, which means you'll be getting more urban legends for every state from here on out. Anyways, as always, it'd help this tiny channel out a lot if you took the time to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and even left a comment saying hi. It'll never cost you a dime, and it's an easy way to tell YouTube that my little channel is worth watching. So with that out of the way, let's get into the myths and legends of North Dakota. First up, we have the Stairway to Hell in Tagus. Now, in this journey, we've seen all sorts of supposed gateways to hell, and in future editions of this series, we'll see even more, I'm sure, but I think it's worth mentioning that North Dakota, supposedly, has one of its own little stairways to hell, or gateways to hell, or whatever you want to call it, in a little town named Tagus that's now essentially a ghost town, with the last business actually shutting its doors in 1976. You can visit this place too if you want, nobody is going to get in your way, but keep in mind, after what you see and hear, you might never be the same. So there's an old church in town that used to bear the name of St. Olaf's, yes, like the snowman from Frozen, and this church used to be of Lutheran denomination. As it stands, the church is, well, just a memorial at this point, as it burnt down in 2001. Urban legends, however, say that before it burnt down, it wasn't as Lutheran as its memorial suggests. Rather, they say that devil worshippers started dwelling on the premises, and that throughout the 80s and 90s, sacrifices that weren't just wild animals were offered up to the Dark Lord, and that there was some man-on-man -man eating going on, if you catch my drift and all sorts of other gruesome, horrible things also occurred on the premises of this old church. There was even a basement on the premises, and this basement is apparently where the most horrible things occurred too, and possibly why they say there is now a gateway to hell at this location. Apparently there was a door with an upside down cross painted on it, and upon opening this door, you would find a staircase that led you far down below the Earth's surface. Nowadays, this basement is apparently filled in, but as the story goes, you're still able to locate where the stairs used to be, because if you stand above these filled in stairs, your ears will become flooded with the screams of the damned. Now, this isn't all this little town has going on for it. Rather, because of this portal to hell, there are some other otherworldly visitors that also call this abandoned town home. To start, they say that there are actually hellhounds patrolling the town. Visitors have reported being scared by vicious, blood-soaked dogs that have appeared seemingly out of nowhere. And these dogs have snarled and snapped at visitors. There's also weird sounds often weeping or moaning or talking, and sometimes the crying of infants can be heard coming from some of the abandoned houses in the town late at night. Finally, they also say that if you wander the city at night, you might stumble on a tombstone that glows in the dark, or you might even see a phantom train run through the town. But regarding leads on which tombstone this is that glows, or where exactly this train passes through, I sadly haven't been able to find anything. So what do we think about this strange little town that seems to run rampant with the damned? Well, on one hand, at least to me, a ghost town that's also a portal to the damned sounds a little bit familiar, as I said earlier. If you remember back in our Kansas episode, there was a certain cemetery that was featured in the show Supernatural that was also in a ghost town, and similarly had tales of portals to hell intertwined with it. There was even a cemetery where the devil himself would make an appearance. To me, it feels like when a place like this has just been left behind, folks look for a reason why it was left behind, and sometimes 
The reason they decide on is that the place must have been cursed. But hey, I mean, maybe that's just my interpretation. What do you think? And do you actually think this is real? Second up, we have the White Lady Lane in Walhalla. This small town of Walhalla has fostered a classic urban legend that embodies much of what I love about folklore. It's confusing. It lives on despite being fostered within a town of only 1,000 people, and most importantly, there's parts of it that might be true. The legend of the White Lady Lane is actually not one story, but rather sort of two competing stories. The first story tells the tale of a woman named Anna, who was apparently gorgeous and lived by the railroad tracks in town. One day, because of her beauty, Anna's mother was approached by a Syrian peddler. And frankly, I find the detail that he was Syrian interesting, but it doesn't appear to matter at all in the story. Regardless, this man's name was Sam, and he wanted to marry Anna. Sam's occupation was that he sold pots, pans, firearms, and other goods, and he thought that this 15-year-old woman would be the right bride for him. Thankfully, Anna's mother had the good sense to tell this man, Sam, no, but also the bad sense to tell him that he could come back and try again a year later when she turned 16. In the meantime, though, Sam basically had to give Anna's mother unlimited access to the goods that he was selling. Now Sam, assuming that he would actually get Anna in the end, thought this was a fine deal, and so of course he took it. But lo and behold, a year later, Sam showed up to claim his bride-to-be and was met again with a refusal from Anna's mother. And he wasn't happy about this. He'd given her a lot of his goods, and therefore he met this refusal with violence. He took out a pew-pew, and he pew-pewed Anna, and then he pew-pewed Anna's mother, and then he tried to pew-pew himself. I excuse the word pew-pew, but YouTube doesn't like the real word for this. Ultimately, Sam was unsuccessful in this latter act of pew-pewing himself because his firearm jammed, which a lot of people take to mean he was selling junky goods because this was a firearm from his truck, but I digress. Uh, and then he decided to use a knife on himself, but his knife was similarly of low quality and extremely dull. And because of this, Sam was out of options, and the authorities got to Sam before Sam could get to Sam himself, and they ended up jailing him for 10 years in the Bismarck State Penitentiary. Now, let's be clear, Anna's mother did survive this, but Anna did not. And this version of the legend says that Anna, because she was so young, at only 16, was not really ready to move on. And so now, near a bridge named Eddie's Bridge in North Dakota, near the area where this happened, she wanders around late into the night every Halloween. You can actually supposedly see her in her white flannel nightgown that she was apparently wearing during this episode, walking through the mist in a nearby bog by the bridge. This nightgown flows behind her as she searches for the peace that she apparently never found in life. Frankly, I don't know why she ended up at this bridge in this version of the story, but this is apparently where she is, and this is what's consistent with the other version of the story. Now, regarding the second version of the story, it's actually quite a bit simpler. This version of a story tells of an Anna who, instead of being approached for marriage, actually became pregnant out of wedlock. And she was a member of an extremely religious family, and hiding this secret from the family did not go well. They soon found out what she'd been up to, and they were very disappointed. Therefore, the family forced her to marry the man who'd gotten her pregnant, which Anna actually did not want to do, and she ended up making her way to the aforementioned Eddie's Bridge from the last story, and she took a jump. Apparently, her new husband, after this, woke up one morning to find the bed next to him was empty unexpectedly, and made his way around town, eventually finding the bridge that she had 
taken a leap from in the woods. And now because of this, near this bridge, again you can see the flowing nightgown of the reluctant new bride wandering through the bog. So at this point, these stories are pretty typical urban legend fare. Woman gets married, doesn't want to get married, and because of this does something drastic. It's pretty common to hear stories like this because perhaps this act was all too common in the past, but in this case, well, there's some verifiable truth behind the urban legend, sadly. If you look up old news articles from the county this took place in, Ward County, North Dakota, you'll actually find an interesting article from November 10th of 1921. It's titled, Pimbina Peddler, Unalives Girl, and then attempts I can't say that word on YouTube. And this article seems to recount the first version of the story, even getting the names Sam and Anna correct. So sadly, it seems like Anna did in fact meet a sad fate at the hands of a monster. So the only detail left is whether or not she is truly wandering in a bog near Eddie's bridge. Admittedly, like all ghost stories, there's really not a lot of proof, but if you're in the area and you've been to Eddie's Bridge or the Bog and you've got a story of your own, I'd love to hear it. Comment below and you know if it's compelling, maybe we can tell it. Next up we have the Takuhi, North Dakota's Bigfoot. So the Takuhi is sort of like Bigfoot, but also sort of different. In Lakota, Takuhi means big man, and in Lakota folklore, the big man is a popular urban legend about a guardian spirit of the land that lives on it and protects the land from invaders, but simultaneously, the Takuhi isn't some kind creature that fraternized with the Lakota natives. Rather, the Lakota sort of feared it in their legends because the big man is known to prey on both animals and humans. The first reports of Takuhi came out in the 1970s. This was fresh off of the tale of the Patterson-Gimlin film Hysteria that brought borderline compelling footage of Bigfoot to the front of America's mind. Because of this, when a similar large hairy man began being sighted in the Fort Bertolt Native American Reservation, and a film crew scouting the film's location in the region came upon large human-like footprints. In the 1970s, rumors began to spread that something was roaming the hills of North Dakota. Also, let me just throw out a bit of fun skepticism here. Why is it always a film crew that finds the good Bigfoot evidence? Regardless, this camera crew interviewed locals after their findings, and sure enough, they weren't alone in finding these footprints. One of the craziest accounts of the Takuhi that also does a good job of characterizing how it differs from normal Bigfoot is that from a man named Lamar Bear Ribs. Pretty cool name, I know, that apparently saw the Takuhi in all of its six to seven foot tall glory standing in front of him. And when it looked at bare ribs, the man apparently had a seizure right then and there. Personally, I can't blame him, but UFO sightings too around this time. And because of this, a lot of folks likened them to one another, speculating that the Takuhi could have been some sort of extraterrestrial. Again, let's keep in mind that this whole Takuhi mania was going on right when we were on the heels of Bigfoot's rise to fame. And it wasn't just North Dakota that was reporting sightings of some big critters. The Takuhi took those same elements from Bigfoot, but appeared to toss in a bit of local Wendigo legend and a bit of UFO folklore beside it. Since the 1970s, this creature hasn't really been spotted much from what I can tell, Heck, according to the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, there haven't really even been accounts of normal Bigfoot since around the 2004 to 2005 timeframe when a bunch of witnesses in White Shield and some, again on native land, 
observed strange large footprints in the snow. Despite this, the Takuhi is still a well-known cryptid in these parts, and if you see big, man-like footprints in North Dakota, I recommend you keep your eyes on the ground at all times until you're a ways away from these suckers. Next, we have General Custer's Haunted House. General Custer was a USA Army officer and cavalry commander during the American Civil War as well as during the American Indian Wars. These days, you might be most familiar with Custer because of his role in the American Indian Wars against the Lakota and other Plains Indian nations, where he perished in a dramatic event known as Custer's Last Stand during the Battle of Little Bighorn, alongside every other soldier in the companies he was leading. Now, because of his involvement in these wars, Custer gets a heck of a bad rap these days, and frankly, he probably deserves it for working alongside the United States government to displace an entire race of people, but I'm not getting into more of that today. What you do need to know for this story is that before the Battle of Little Bighorn, where he passed away, Custer and his wife lived on Fort Abraham Lincoln in North Dakota, where six companies of cavalry resided along with three barracks, a commissary, a granary, a stable, a hospital, and homes for all of these soldiers, including Custer. And sure enough, Custer himself dwelled in a house that was built on the property. The first house that they built actually burnt down, but they rebuilt it, and they had made this home stand out about as much as they could for it being on a military fort's property. The house was two stories, it had a lot of space, it had a beautiful porch, and lots of land, and today you can go to a recreation of this house and you'll find folks dressed for the part of an 1870s US Army member ordering you around and role-playing quite nicely. Custer himself, though, sadly only got to enjoy living in this home for a small length of time. As in 1876, as I stated, he met his fateful end alongside a ton of other American soldiers. So before we dive into the paranormal here, imagine what must have been going on at that fort. An entire division of cavalry at this one fort was wiped out in a single day. This meant a lot of empty homes, and tons of widows living at Fort Abraham Lincoln for a while. But time went on, the railroad finally connected the region to the rest of the USA, and by the 1890s, Fort Abraham Lincoln was actually decommissioned, and the buildings there were largely deconstructed by locals who needed raw materials. This is until 1932, when the area was actually declared a state park, and the Conservation Corps began to rebuild the old fort as a replica. And these replicas include the General Custer House itself. Now, I sort of take issue with the story at this point. Why the heck would a ghost that isn't even buried on site haunt a replica of a home they used to live in, not even the real thing? I did some googling on this topic, and ghost websites, I say that in air quotes, seem to say that ghosts are generally thrilled about their old homes being restored, so they take up residence or visit the properties. This is one heck of a cop-out, but whatever, this is what people report occurs in these haunted replica houses. So to start talking about the hauntings that supposedly occur at this house, individuals that work on site dress in period correct clothing, and it's said that this invites spirits from the time to walk among them. Additionally, because Custer was booted from the home he loved so much so quickly, it's said that he returns to make sure he can spend adequate time in the house that he so dearly loved. Regardless, in the Custer house, folks often feel supernatural phenomena like cold spots hitting them and giving them the chills, particularly when they're standing near the air conditioning vents. I mean, um, in General Custer's old room. They've also reported seeing flashing when folks point their iPhones, I mean, when strange shadows of individuals dart from room to room in front of them. Also, lights have known to turn on and off on their own, and people report feeling watched, 
especially when they've recently forgotten their anniversary with their spouses. Now, I can stop joking here for a second. On a more serious note, there have been interesting EVPs caught, or sound bites of intelligible words recorded of conversations that sound like they could have been between Custer and his wife. Additionally, in the upstairs bedroom used by the widow of General Custer, an EVP of a woman is frequently heard and sometimes, in photos, you can see someone odd standing among the rest of the guests that, by all reports, wasn't actually on the tour with them. Now, if you can't tell, I think the history here is extremely interesting, and folks genuinely say that the replica of this fort is haunted. But frankly, I'm not convinced. Again, why would a ghost haunt a house that they never even lived in, when they're buried, to be specific, 326 miles away at the Battle of Little Bighorn? Maybe I'm being too harsh here, but I don't know. There are some compelling and interesting EVPs that you can find by googling this on YouTube, but frankly, I just don't get this one. This is folklore at its worst in my opinion, and it just kind of feels made up for the sake of sensationalism. I don't generally believe ghost stories, but what I feel about this story goes beyond disbelief. Next up, we have San Haven Sanatorium. Remember Waverly Hills in Kentucky? Well, it wasn't alone in being a gigantic, semi-isolated tuberculosis sanatorium. San Haven Sanatorium, originally dubbed the North Dakota Tuberculosis Sanatorium, near Dunseth, North Carolina, holds a similar reputation. Built in 1912 and running through 1987, the sanatorium was known for crowding in its early days, and in the 60s, after tuberculosis vaccines were widespread, it was transitioned to an asylum for the mentally and physically unwell, just like Waverly Hills, where supposed patient neglect was widespread. And although this neglect was denied by staff, the hospital closed in 1987. Today, because of its abandonment, San Haven appears to be a wild place. Nature has reclaimed it in part, and there are trees and shrubs growing both on and inside of the building, as well as all over the walking paths around it. Birds have also apparently taken up residence inside of the building, giving it an eerie vibe as the chirps of these birds often supposedly sound like the cries of laughter of children playing in the halls of the sanatorium. And when your mind distorts reality in the sanatorium's dark hallways. Now, because of the amount of hubbub this place has gotten, it's said that, as you would expect, some of the old patients still linger here. Visitors have been scratched. Folks claim the classic being watched feeling in the sanatorium and the oh-so-reputable Ghost Adventure Boys from the Travel Channel even decided to pay the sanatorium a visit because of this, claiming the classic, it's haunted because there were satanic rituals here. Now, while the Ghost Adventures cast was there, members of the cast were indeed scratched, but also they were apparently attacked by unseen entities that went as far as to follow them home. They also observed strange phenomenon in an elevator shaft on that day that, in 2001, saw a 17-year-old trespasser fall to his demise. Now, what I will say about this old sanatorium is that if it is haunted, it hasn't really caught on. Perhaps that's because it's not presently open to be visited by any old member of the public like Waverly Hills and other similar kindred spirit-like sanatoriums. Regardless, scouring the internet for chilling tales about this place, while it didn't yield much but speculation, did yield something, something that shows that all of this speculation about haunting on the land might change. As in 2023, the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa natives received a $1 million grant from the EPA to clean the main building of the hospital up, per the EPA's briefing, 
asbestos, lead, and polychlorinated biphenyl contaminated the site, and it would be cleaned up and they'd actually demolish the site to make way for new housing, an RV park, and campgrounds. Ah, if I could buy stocks that went up in value when a place was anticipated to be haunted and then subsequently had haunted stories told about it, I'd be purchasing the heck out of stocks for this redevelopment. Haunted campground in North Dakota? Here we come. Next, we have the Mini Washitu. This creature that I'm probably slaughtering the pronunciation of is probably the most popular, unique, and well-known cryptid to call North Dakota its home. The cryptid isn't land-dwelling like most, but rather lives in the waters of the Missouri River, and tales of its horrors date back to the mythology of the Dakota natives, who tell tales of a beast covered in red hair with a single eye and a horn. They also say the creature is strangely human in its hands, and that it walks on hooves like some sort of bovine. The earliest western record of the Mini Washitu is from the 20th century, where an ethnologist, Melvin Randolph Gilmore, was told by natives the tale of the creature that would drive an individual mad and possibly even end their life if they so much as looked at the creature, much like the Bigfoot lookalike we discussed earlier. With this in mind, you might be wondering how folks even reported the creature's existence or appearance, and the rebuttal is that one particular individual actually survived just long enough to describe what happened to him, and this description is the basis for the modern folklore. Now, strangely, this creature isn't all bad news though. Yes, its sight might be enough to destroy the sanity of a human mind, but apparently, it also helps break the ice that accumulates on the cold North Dakota portion of the Missouri River, allowing the natives in the past to navigate and fish the river earlier in the season, and helping them survive by proxy. It's actually this bit of folklore that segues us nicely into the does it exist portion of the cryptid. And frankly, the answer is, as usual, probably not. But this ice-breaking ability and large size have actually led some skeptics and experts alike to hypothesize that this tale by natives actually comes from real-world sightings of river sturgeon, who have been observed to grow to be gigantic and are even well-known to sometimes breach the surface of the Missouri River. Of course, these details wouldn't explain, you know, the creature's horn or the one eye, or the fact that it can drive individuals mad, but I digress, this folklore probably runs a bit deeper than modern individuals can grasp. Next, we have the Fargo UFO of 1948. Now, this fable goes that in 1948, there was a spectacular sight to see in the skies above Fargo, North Dakota, on one fall evening. Funnily enough, obviously the local news didn't have a seer on staff, but the October 1st headline was Aerial Display Likely in Bison Augustana Game Tonight, in reference to the local football game that would be playing in Fargo, not knowing that something even more spectacular would be flying its way through the night sky something that made its way into recently declassified federal investigations of unidentified aerial phenomena, in fact, and events that are now known as the Gorman Dogfight. Now, as you may have guessed from an event known as the Gorman Dogfight, the star of this tale is a man with the last name Gorman, Norbert Gorman, in fact. He was a Fargo native who, during World War II, became a B-25 instructor for French aviators, and when North Dakota's National Guard launched at Fargo Airport, Gorman, given his expertise flying, was quick to join their ranks. These are the events that led to Gorman and some other pilots flying P-51 Mustangs through the evening sky of October 1st, with part of their intention being to fly over the Bison's football game that I mentioned earlier. 
Now, by kickoff, which was at 8 p.m., most of the pilots decided their night in the sky was over, and they wanted to get home to see their families. But Gorman, I suppose being a lover of aviation, stayed in the air just a bit longer and would eventually make it over the football field. Now, on this way, Gorman was alerted to a nearby smaller plane. And when he visually confirmed this smaller plane, he also noticed something else that hadn't been pointed out to him by ground radar. By his own account, this was, I quote, a flying disc with sharp edges and some lighting on it. And the craft was circling the city and it didn't show up on my radar. Now, Gorman flew a bit closer, but the craft apparently lit up even more, got really bright, and then it flew away from Gorman at speeds that were unobtainable by his aircraft. He estimated it accelerated quickly to about 600 miles an hour. It then flew right back at him, almost hitting Gorman's craft, but then it went right over his plane, and he actually ducked to make sure it didn't hit him. It was kind of crazy, apparently. This back-and-forth sort of chase game lasted nearly half an hour, and declassified documents reveal sketches and diagrams of the craft that Gorman actually drew the night of his encounter after this close encounter he had. So after this event, Gorman actually did go through the chain of command. He informed his higher-ups, and the event went so far as to have federal investigators come and question him. Additionally, Gorman wrote a sworn statement about the event, where he insisted that the aircraft was driven with intelligence. Ultimately though, as you'd expect, the Air Force conducted an investigation and became convinced of the strange, at least to me, conclusion that Gorman observed the age-old weather balloon and became confused by the planet Jupiter too. Despite Gorman's insistence that he was correct, the Air Force folks claimed that that was all there was to it, and if he pursued it further, he would be court-martialed, and with that, the case was closed. Oh, and if you're wondering, the Bisons did win the football game that night. Go Fargo. So, let's be clear about this. I have my doubts over the truth of this episode. Not only was the topic of alien visitors commonly discussed during this time frame, but much like the Bigfoot story I tell in this video, this episode came right off of the heels of a big ticket event in its own subcategory, Roswell, which happened to just have occurred a year earlier. Now I digress, Roswell didn't get popular among the UFO crowd until decades later, but still, just a year prior to this event, the idea of flying saucers in the sky operated by extraterrestrials had been circulated in the press. I just want us to keep in mind that UFOs weren't necessarily a taboo at the time that this occurred. They certainly didn't talk about them in the military yet, but in public discussion, it was pretty open season. Regardless, this account was by a seasoned Air Force veteran that didn't, from what I can tell, have a track record for making up bogus stories, and should have had a knack for identifying aircraft. Also, given this event was in the recent federal government's Project Blue Book case file, clearly the Air Force was a little more concerned about this episode than it let on. Next up, we have the ghosts of Bismarck, North Dakota. Now, Bismarck is the capital of North Dakota, despite the state being better known for and more populated in Fargo. As you'd expect, the population is a little bit sparse. It hovers around 74,000 people per 2022, with a metropolitan area population about the size of Albany, New York's population, if that's any better scale of reference. The city is actually fairly old by American standards. It was built in 1872, and it's sort of merged with the city across the river, Mandan, like the Twin Cities of Minnesota. Now, as always, the state capital and its associated library are supposedly haunted places in North Dakota, like many other states we've visited, with multiple accounts of spooky stuff going on. In 1972, for instance, the building superintendent, while working late with his dog by his side, decided the dog and him needed a quick walk, so 
They went down to the first floor. On the way there, though, the dog decided something was out of place for him, and he charged down the hallway into a dark cellar, growling at something. But quickly, a yelp could be heard, and the dog came running back to the owner with his tail between his legs. The same superintendent had another episode too. While there, he once saw a man that he didn't recognize walk into a storage area on the property. And curious, he decided that he should follow the man to see what he was up to in this room. And when he got to the storage room, he saw there weren't any lights on. And when he indeed turned them on, he checked the room thoroughly and was able to find nobody. Frankly, the superintendent had some guts. When my pet shepherd growls, it gets my attention, and when she yelps, I generally start running. She's a lot tougher than me, though. Additionally, in the State Capitol Library in 1967, an archivist, who presumed he was alone in the basement of the building, heard his name called. And he went searching for whoever called his name, presuming it might be his friend who circled back to the building. But after about 15 minutes of fruitless searching, he decided to go up two floors. When he did, he found the friend he'd been looking for there, and his friend hadn't been in the basement all day. There's also the former governor's mansion in Bismarck that is claimed to be haunted as heck. The building was built in 1893, and it was occupied until about 1960 by governors of North Dakota. Most notably, the room where one former governor that owned the home, Governor Briggs, passed away is known to be a hotspot for paranormal happenings. According to visitors touring the historic site, the door to this room is known to open and close when nobody's around, and sometimes the curtains have been seen moving and even shutting on their own. Additionally, closet doors sometimes slam shut in the room, and you can hear creaking and it seems like this ghost isn't just relaxing for all eternity either, as footsteps are often heard creaking their way up and down the main staircase of the house. Staff and visitors alike have been haunted too by this chilling sound, and occasionally, the creaks and sounds of individuals speaking have been heard coming from the house's attic. There are also a couple of commercial buildings in Bismarck that have made a name for themselves. Chiefly, there's a country club, the Apple Creek Country Club, that's supposedly semi-famous for a ghostly ex-chef of the country club's restaurant that didn't really feel like retiring. Ever since his passing, they say that dishes and silverware have been witnessed by staff and patrons to go flying off of counters and tables Additionally, kitchen employees commonly hear pots and pans jostling around in the kitchen when they're closing up shop or arriving for the day, being moved by figures that can't be seen. There's also the Peacock Alley Bar and Restaurant. Now, this spot has been around for nearly 100 years at this point, and it's part of another historic building, the Patterson Hotel. Back in the day, this was a luxurious spot for high society folks to grab a bite to eat, but during Prohibition, the spot became a speakeasy, where people could indulge in their less-than-legal vices. Additionally, this spot was converted to a senior living facility in the 1970s, but these days it's once again a restaurant and a bar. Now, despite all of this transition, the place apparently wants to hold on to its past. Folks visiting the establishment and staff working there have reported having conversations with employees at the bar only to legitimately see them vanish or walk into another room never to return. Don't get me wrong, I've been ghosted by a bartender before, but I've never seen one fade away in front of me. That's more of something you expect from your friends with kids after 9pm or a date you met on Tinder. There's also the classic glasses and plates flying about and breaking, which Again, I've seen plenty of at bars with normal living staff and patrons, but I digress. I can less easily explain why guests staying at the connected Patterson Hotel can hear guests partying late into the night in the bar when the bar closes promptly at 11 p.m., per Google Maps at least. This is apparently a spooky and frequently reported occurrence. 
With all of this in mind, I never really thought much about Bismarck. To be frank, I didn't even know it existed until I made this video, but if all of these ghosts want to stick around, maybe it's worth a visit one day. Have you seen any haunted happenings in the city of Bismarck? Let me know in the comments below. And here we have Bloody Knife's Horse. Now, this urban legend, if you can even call it that, is less of a western tale, and rather a tale told by the Arikara people. Bloody Knife, pictured here, was a Native American man who served as a scout and a guide for the U.S. 7th Cavalry Regiment, and at one point he won the favor of General Custer while serving the U.S. Army. His father was a Sioux native, and his mother was Arikara, and due to this mixed lineage, the Sioux natives that he was raised with treated him very poorly, including the native chief. This led to Bloody Knife going to live with the Arikara tribe when he was a teen, who treated him much better, and ultimately led him to work for the American Fur Company and the U.S. Army. By all accounts, Bloody Knife was kind of a butt to the Americans he interacted with, though given how the American forces treated the natives, that's totally forgivable. Despite this though, Custer admired Bloody Knife's talent, and because of this and perhaps Bloody Knife's disdain for the Sioux tribe that treated him so poorly, Bloody Knife was led down a path of conflict with the Sioux. One of these conflicts was actually the Battle at Yellowstone, of which Bloody Knife prompted by tracking the trail of Sioux warriors. Ultimately though, his tracking prowess led him to be by General Custer's side at the Battle of Little Bighorn. It's said that during the conflict, Bloody Knife had the good sense to recommend a retreat given how outnumbered they were, but the stubborn General Custer refused and Bloody Knife, loyal to a fault, wouldn't let Custer die without him. Here, Bloody Knife perished alongside a few of the other Arikara scouts, but it's said that his horse remarkably survived the incident. Now while there aren't any academic or otherwise credible sources about this occurring, Arikara folklore says that following the Battle of Little Bighorn, Bloody Knife's horse actually walked all the way from the battlefield at Little Bighorn, 500 miles away, to a place called like a fishhook village, an Arikara native settlement in North Dakota, which would be the horse's final resting place. The belief of the natives living at the settlement when they saw the horse arrive was somehow the spirits of all of those who died on the battlefield, both native and US forces alike, entered Bloody Knife's horse, and they say that because of this, his horse actually started legitimately telling the tale of the bravery of the warriors who passed on that fateful day. Finally, we have the Horace Mann Elementary School Elephant. Horace Mann Elementary in Fargo was built in 1915, but before that it was a plot of land known as Hector's Edition, which was part of the county's fairgrounds. And if you've ever been to a fairground in America, you'll be well aware that this makes the area liable for some strange stuff to go down, which is exactly the case in this story. Fairgrounds host a lot of different activities, of course. This includes fairs and conventions, but also circuses. And with circuses come animals, and chief among those animals used to be elephants. Now, this folktale tells the story of an elephant that was brought alongside a circus to Hector's edition, and while it was on the property, it sadly passed away. Now, elephants are big, heck my Subaru Forester can't even tow an elephant's weight, which generally falls between 6 and 13,000 pounds, and this makes towing an elephant elsewhere to bury it expensive. So it's said that, the night before the circus left town, they dug up a plot of land and buried the elephant right there, without getting caught. Now, this is where the legend sort of ends, and the fact remains that on this plot of land, Horace Mann Elementary School was eventually built. So, most people would probably hear this story and laugh it off. Heck, I did it first too. That was until I read the small bits of evidence to support this story's insanity. 
Apparently, while this land was known as Hector's Edition, 80 circuses actually visited the location, with a reported 10 actually camping on site. And most of these circuses actually did have an elephant with them, per reporting by local news sources. All of these sleuthing by local news actually led to an estimate that this elephant debacle likely occurred between 1892 and 1905, which is the gap between the naming of Hector's addition, or its purchase by one Marden Hector, and the time when circuses stopped performing on Hector's addition. This elephant also wouldn't be the only circus animal to be buried in Fargo. Apparently in 1907, a camel passed away, and it was actually buried near Fargo North High School. Regardless, there are no records of this elephant's passing if it is in fact buried on site of Horace Mann Elementary. Because of this, most people think that by proxy of the camel story, the elephant legend persists to this day. Additionally, the legend persists because saying there's an elephant buried anywhere is quite the claim, and it sticks around a little bit more than talking about a camel, I guess. Perhaps we'll never know, but personally, I would love to see someone try and excavate the whole grounds to find that dang elephant. Now, if I get 30 million subscribers, I personally promise to fund this effort in any capacity that I'm able. This isn't even a joke. Woohoo, that was a long one, huh? North Dakota sure surprised me. Thank you for joining me though, regardless of this video's length. Now remember, if you like this video, and you want future and past videos from me to show up on your feed, that you can subscribe to this channel, and you can even like this video if you want to let the world know that I exist. This way you won't miss it when we move on to our next state, Ohio. And remember, most importantly, whether you were digging out by the elementary school and you unearthed the dang elephant bone, or if you were flying over Fargo and saw something fishy darting around the sky, don't you ever forget, it's always story time.